Good evening. Um, welcome to the May 2024 meeting of the Racial Disparities Advisory Panel. Let's do our um, introductions. Sorry, I'm being a little slow tonight, it seems. Julio, can you start us off, please? Sure, I'm Julio Thompson. I'm an Assistant Attorney General and the Director of the Civil Rights Unit. I'm here representing uh, A.G. Clark. Great, thank you. Daniel. Dan Bennett, I'm a Sergeant of the Vermont State Police and Co-Director for, excuse me, Deputy Director <laughs> for the uh, Fair and Impartial Policing with the lovely Mr. Aton. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tyler. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, lovely, Aton. I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> um, my name is Tyler Allen. I'm the Adolescent Services Director for the Family Services Division of DCF, and I am the commissioner, Commissioner's Designated Appointee for DCF. Thank you. Laura. Hi, everybody. My name is Laura Carter. I am a data analyst within the Division of Racial Justice Statistics, which is in the Office of Racial Equity. Great. Thank you. Arika. Did I get that anywhere remotely right? You were close. It's Erica. It's just Erica. differently. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. Good evening, everyone. I'm Erica Radke, Deputy Commissioner of the Family Services Division of DCF. And I'm happy to be here. Great. Thank you for coming. Chris. Yeah, uh, Christopher Loris, public observer from Rutland, Vermont. Great. Elizabeth. Hey, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Morris. I'm the Juvenile Justice Coordinator at FSD. And I'm not um, the designee, but haven't gotten rid of me yet. So. <laughs> Nice and you sometimes all. you're the designee's designee. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while. <laughs> oh, Kaya, okay, uh, it's good to see you. It is nice to see you too. Hi, I'm Kaya Ganguly. I am the Director of Trauma Prevention and Resilience Development for the state of Vermont, and I sit within the Department of Mental Health. Thank you. Grant. Hello, I'm Grant Taylor. I'm here taking minutes for the meeting. Great. Thank you. Judge Morrissey. Hi, I'm Mary Morrissey. I'm the Judiciary's representative on the committee. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Um, Sheila. You're muted. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Sheila Linton, she, her, her pronouns, um, panel member, um, co-founder and executive director of the Root Social Justice Center. Great. Uh, Chief Stevens. I am uh, Don Stevens, chief of the Nalhegan Abenaki tribe, executive director of Abenaki Help in Abenaki. I'm a panel member appointed by the attorney general's office. Thank you. Thank you. Isabella Whalen. Hi, I'm Isabella Whalen. Um, I'm the new housing program coordinator for the Department of Corrections and the Restorative Justice Unit. Um, Derek is one of my supervisors, and I'm just here to observe. So thanks for letting me be here. Absolutely. Thank you. Derek. Hi, good evening, everyone. Derek, me, Dovnik, he, him pronouns. Uh, I am the representative of the Commissioner of the Department of Corrections to RDAP. Great, thanks. Barzana. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Barzana Leva, Orleans County State's Attorney, uh, representing the Department of State's Attorneys. Great, thank you. And Reverend Hughes. Hey, good afternoon, or good evening, rather. <clears throat> I'm, um, Reverend Mark Hughes, I'm the executive of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. I am here as an observer and also um, hopefully I can get a, a, shot, a, a chance to get in on a, a public comment. So I've got a, got a thing or two I'd like to say as well. 
want to give a shout out uh, to um, to Kea uh, that you've who you've already met, and also uh, to uh, to Sheila, uh, who's I saw her on there, and I think I saw Erica Radke as well. So mm -hmm. I just want to give a shout out to the sisters. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, we will begin with the approval of April's minutes. Uh, does anyone have comments, corrections, things that are missing, errata, anything of the sort? Addenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. I'd make a motion to approve the April minutes. Grand. And a second? I'll second it. And Tom. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, signify in some dramatic way. Aye. 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 Great. All opposed? OK. All abstaining? Minutes are passed as submitted. Thank you, Grant, as always. Um, announcements. Mark, is this a good time for you to say something? Yep, I can do that. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. There's a couple of things that I was kicking around. And um, one was the, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I got some, I had some, I got some Doritos going on over, on over here. So one has to do with the um, the report. And I spoke to Pepper again this week, and I know he spoke to you, mm -hmm. um, Aton. And um, for those who are on the call, um, I think there was a report that was called for from um, from Keisha's committee, um, economic blah 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 blah, and it was um, it was supposed to um, it'll be I guess done to speak towards the um, equity, equity reinvestment um, from the Cannabis Development Fund. And I don't know that uh, that was ever done. I know, you, I know there was a report that came out of this committee, but that report did not. And it no. was supposed to have come out of this committee for this last legislative session. And just for context, we've been working on um, the allocation of uh, the, the the prospect of the allocation of equity funds uh, of of uh, I should say um, some of these excise taxes because I think there's only about thirty percent that's actually allocated right now. We're looking to place them towards some some of our equity initiatives across the state, um, and they were looking for some type of um, analysis. Okay. I think the analysis they were looking, you know, it was like, you know, was point was how in Vermont, um, the that black and brown people were affected by, you know, this marijuana cigarette, you know, on this day at this time in history or or something like that. Um, and I think we talked, uh, Susan and I talked before she went out and we were talking about the idea that perhaps the approach to that analysis should be more along the lines of the acceptance of the existence of systemic racism and understanding that we are not just a state, we're also a nation here, and that the vast majority of Black people here um, actually come from somewhere else, and that uh, the war on drugs is just one instrument uh, in um, systemic oppression and just to be able to try to look at that report more broadly, I mean, maybe answer your question, but just contextualize it in the appropriate manner, because I, I think that we've created ourselves a slippery slope uh, with those types of analysis. So that, that was one thing that I want to give you for your consideration. I know that, as I said, um, that Pepper has spoken to you this week, so I'd be interested to hear uh, back. Would you like me to stop here and, and wait and, and get a response from you, or would you like me to complete my second thought? I can simply respond. Pepper um, asked me about um, 
the presence of the chair of the RDAP on a particular committee that was proposed mm -hmm. by this bill. Um, and I simply said that that would be something that needs rewriting because I personally do not have more time to serve on yet another panel or committee. Right. Was, That's was there all. Any, was there any question? Was there any discussion regarding the the report itself, though? I mean, I think no. that, that were two separate issues there. No. No conversation about a report, huh? Well, there was a conversation about a report, obviously, and that what said in the report was, I needed to find the time to serve on a committee, and I said I can't. Mm -hmm. So that would need to be rewritten. Okay, well, maybe we could take it offline then, because uh, the um, there there are two separate issues that uh, Pepper was talking about. One was uh, some emerging uh, language in H six twelve. Uh, where a committee was being formed. And the other one was a totally different conversation about a report that the RDAP was actually charged to prepare for yes. uh, this biennium. Is th this, this, the RDAP has not produced that report. It's not by any means done. Laura, that was something that we, we were working on right in the division, correct? Was so getting we have we did a presentation, Tiffany and I did a couple right. months ago. Yeah. And um, I, from my understanding, we were there to assist with the report, not write the right. report. So right. I, I know that I haven't been given any additional direction. I, and no. I don't think Pepper has talked to Susanna or anything. No, I'm sure he hasn't. Um, no, that, uh, that has not happened yet because we were finishing the other report, which we were mandated to write. So we are a bit behind, we are aware of that, but that's really all I can tell you, Mark. Okay, so just in the interest of time and out of respect for the, the, um, the, the panel, I'm gonna just defer the other question. Uh, if we have time later in the meeting, I'll, I'll come back to it. Otherwise, I'll, I'll ask for some time on the agenda next time. Got it, okay, Thanks. not a problem. Um, thank you. Rebecca is clearly not here. Um, poor Jess Brown is grading. Um, <laughs> so like she has to have them done tonight. So she really had to spend her time there. Um, those are the two RSVPs, if you were, um, that I have gotten um, about this evening. Um, that's really it for now. Um, anything else anybody has? No. Okay. Tyler, can I turn the floor over to you? Uh, happy to take it, Aton. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, um, so a couple meetings back, we had a discussion towards the end around DCF, at the end of RDAP in general around DCF, I think initially the conversation was a little bit about um, the utilization of the rest stop or, or what we refer to as alternative settings, placement settings. I touched on this a little bit when we got together last month as well, just getting clarification on how we wanted to discuss these um, things. And I think it's a little bit of a broader conversation than just the utilization of the rest stop or alternative setting placement. It was more grounded in juvenile, not just juvenile justice practice, but DCF practice in terms of how they work with, with families um, for placement specific, um, more specifically to what we refer to as our high-end system of care. And what high-end system of care really, you know, is a, it's, a, it's any kind of an insider term that has now become a little bit more of a common parlance in the state, but it's, um, it refers to our kind of residential placement settings that are within DCF's reach, um, but specifically to those that addresses kind of the emergent, situ emergent situations uh, where there's a lot of urgency, um, a high acuity of need with an individual youth or something along those. We kind of refer that to the as the higher end of the system of care. A system of care 
um, is, is much broader. That would include foster care. It would include kinship care placements, other levels of community placement. When we're talking about high-end system of care, um, we're usually referring to an individual who needs maybe a little bit more intensive mental health treatment is associated with their placement. Um, there's some urgency around the placement itself in that um, we that we're, you know we have difficulty finding placement opportunities for a young person, so on and so forth. So I think these things all kind of crash together. Our use of alternative settings um, is really stems from what we have capacity for in our residential placement system of care and foster care system of care, but more the high end of the residential system of care. And so we've given a number of, DCF's given a number of presentations at the legislature around this conversation over the past years. Um, this has been one of those situations that for the past, I will say, three years, um, th th there, there has been a, a dramatic deficit in, in what we have access to for residential placement. And it has currently forced the department to do a lot of rethinking about how we're able to um, serve youth and families in a number of directions, which would include expanding the high-end system of care. So that's just to kind of get us, I put, I pulled up a, kind of refurbished a PowerPoint that uh, we had that we put out there before um, through the legislature. There might be some folks who saw some of this. So my thinking for this would be, I can pull up this PowerPoint if you all are interested, um, kind of walk through it relatively quickly. Um, of course, pausing as questions come up because I think for this group, the more meaningful um, part of these conversations is the conversation, not the presentation. And so I thought we could maybe walk through, this is DCF's perspective on where the need is, um, what the rationale behind our placement types looks like. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Radke is here with me. Uh, I didn't give her any briefing in terms of how to get through this PowerPoint presentation. So I think I'll shoulder that um, more, uh, but I would welcome you Deputy Commissioner to interrupt me at any point and correct me or take the reins from me. Uh, I know my place on the proverbial totem pole. And uh, when we get to the end of that presentation, certainly I'll stop it. And then we just like to open up a, a discussion for what comes up for people, what they'd like to talk about, what questions come up for them. Knowing that we have a part two to this conversation and the part two, as I understood it from last time we met was to get into the data a little bit deeper. Elizabeth Morris, who is a uh, stalwart participant in this group, actually prepares race race data for the state that she submits annually. So um, she's going to be coming with a lot more conversation around what the data we have access to. And of course, that conversation will probably run in a little bit to what we're talking about today. So if you have thoughts that come up for you between today's meeting and June's meeting, that's okay. We'll have a chance to 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 rediscuss. Is my understanding? Do I have that about right, Aton? Do you do? Nice. I will see if I can share this. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Is there anybody who can give me? I the believe power? Julio needs to do that. Um, because I don't think I can do it. Or Julio, I'm happy to send you the presentation I have or anyone, I guess, that has the power. Can you try it now? I've enabled participants to screen share. Oh, let me try it. And I want to recognize what you just said, Chief. Thank you. I'm I'm realizing the statement I made. Uh, and it shows some of my ignorance. I did not realize that. I feel like I've always heard that expression is the, the, the elements, it has something to do with it. So I have learned something profound today. And as always, Chief, I appreciate your, your wisdom and your, your gentle, um, what is it? Um, gentle pull, uh, pull, pull back. Let me try again. System of care. Great. It shows the screen. Can can everybody see this? Yes. I'll start up that. And great, I can still see. Perfect. All right, I'm gonna make this a little bigger. 
Nope, I just made it smaller. Give me one sec to step out. I lost you all, and I'll try this one more time. All right, well, I'm just going to talk. I can't see anybody, so I'm going to ask folks to uh, let me know if somebody <clears throat> has anything to say, okay? Sure. sure. Um, we'll do. Thank you. All right, so I'll go through this relatively quickly. So we submitted um, a couple reports in the end of last year talking about what our system of care looks like um, because there's a great deal of interest in DCFs developing full capacity to be able to serve youth as they're needed. Uh, this next slide actually is what I'll use as a little bit of a talking point to show how things have changed in the past few years. So. This is a chart which really shows what we have access to in our in-state residential system of care. Um, so what, what's meaningful for me in terms of the numbers is the line where it says actual capacity. Um, we, that's referring to the percent of the pre-pandemic contracted capacity we had. So there's all these different levels of care from secure programming, folks may know that is what was Woodside at one time, through what we call crisis stabilization, which is, means a very short-term emergency-based placement setting, mental health emergency beds, which is short-term emergency placement specific to mental health. They're often called uh, e-beds, um, and some folks may know those, the NFI programs. There's two NFI emergency hospital diversion placements. Um, then there's a couple other that fall into that category too. There's shorter term stabilization program. Those are different from crisis stabilization. They're usually a little bit longer term um, and they're a little bit less intensity in the, in the resource. Then there's intensive residential programming and community-based residential. And so if you see how much capacity we had before the pandemic, there was roughly 200 beds if you put all that together. Um, and then at the end of last year, we had a little over half that. That actually reflects a great deal of building. We've been building that over the past, um, past several years. We dropped down well below 50% at one point. And why this is significant for DCF is that this, when, when the system of care is under this level of stress, um, uh, lack of capacity, what often means is youth with the highest acuity needs get put in the program that will most likely serve, be able to serve them. And usually that refers to crisis stabilization. A crisis stabilization program, which was really intended to be 14 to 30 days, a short-term treatment, would have youth with higher level needs that didn't have other programming that they could step into, other long-term residential care program they could go into. And so they would end up staying in that setting for sometimes months and months. And what happens when you say in the inappropriate level of care for too long is not only does that dysregulate the youth who are in that program, who are, who are serving it, but it also use, usually means that the program staff have to increase their staffing or more specifically decrease their census so that they can have a balance where they can maintain the overall um, safety of the program. And so what it is, is it erodes our bed capacity. It puts kids in the setting that they shouldn't be in for too long. And then it kind of creates a pressure cooker scenario. The other thing that happens in this setting is a kid that might have higher end mental health challenges are put in the same setting as a youth who's suffering from kind of higher risk uh, delinquency concerns or um, or, or other forms of uh, placement uh, destabilization, or sometimes there's a developmental um, or intellectual disability that is of concern, which makes placement hard, all kind of put in the same program together, which we also know is not really supporting a healthy case mix. And so what happens is that environment can turn into a pressure cooker and it really opens up the capacity to do harm for the youth who are in all the programs not all, so it kind of creates 
you know, to put it very bluntly, almost like a log jam within the system where we can't fluidly move kids into the levels of care they need to be because all of those levels of care are under resourced. Now, these are only DCF capacity or DCF placement programs. This isn't referring to hospitals or other settings um, which are were, have also been suffering the same the, the, the same kind of concerns. And so all of these do go into each other at some point. And it just, I, I put this out there to say that's some of the context for what really describes a small percentage of the population that DCF serves. DCF serves roughly a thousand young people, um, children and youth, and, and uh, within the context of their families. And of that thousand, we're talking about a hundred of them or so who are in this residential system of care, whether in state or out of state. So most of most people we serve are served in the community. Most people were, were served ideally or served within even in their family environment or in a kinship placement. Um, but this refers to kind of the higher end of the spectrum. I'll move a little bit more quickly, but I'll pause it. And were there any hands or questions? Because I can't see anybody. We haven't had any yet. Excellent. This gets me to um, the rest stop. Um, the rest stop and other alternative setting placements. This would include, we have a, a building called the Yellow House, which is up in Lamoille County. Um, there's an apartment in Chelsea uh, that we have access to. Um, there is the, the, the project we have, the program we have built up in Middlesex. We have uh, capacity to staff cases in but this is a practice um, where we have a youth who is in a, at a point of placement crisis, who may need a level of res, who often needs a level of residential care that they can't get into. And sometimes they are, say, in a situation where they're in a crisis stabilization program, their behavior, they're decompensating in that program because maybe they've been there too long and we haven't been able to step them out. Those youth, um, they're harder and harder and harder to find a residential program for them because they're in a little bit of a dysregulated place in their stabilization setting. So that might be the type of kid who we'd need to put in this environment. Another scenario we might have to is uh, if there's a kid who has medical care um, that they need that that make it so that uh, you know programs are less likely to accept them in. Um, or something along those lines. But in the end of the day, the department is the custodian for these cases. So if there is no young, if there is no bed to sleep in, so to speak, there is no place to go. We cannot identify a community placement. We cannot find a foster family through kind of exhausted, you know, exhausted seeking and searching uh, that goes up to a state level. We pull together high-end staffing teams where you have state participants working with the district office, trying to identify anybody and anywhere in any situation where we can get a young person. If we're not able to find that, we go into, uh, we'll, we'll sometimes use these high-end or these um, alternative settings. We don't like using them. Uh, the reason we use them is, is, is out of necessity, but the reason we don't like them is there's no treatment attached to it. There's not an educational protocol attached to it. It means we are usually using family services division staff, the, the family service workers, um, in overtime hours to staff around the clock to be in one of these environments with a young people, with a young person trying to make them feel safe as much as possible, trying to be supportive of their needs as much as possible, while we try to figure out what other placement options are there, what other family can we find, what other foster opportunity, is there something else? So we have had to organize this practice. One question from Chief sure. Dom. Yes, Chief. Yeah, um, maybe this is a general question and might need to wait till the end, but I know that within DCF, they are position created for um for extending the Indian Child Welfare Act down to Abenaki children within the state of Vermont and you guys hired Marshall Rich mm -hmm. to within DCF to do that so I just want to know I guess at some point obviously if a kid is in crisis you're going to deal with that first but I want to know how I guess how what you're talking about all that fits in because we're treated a little different sometimes than other uh, populations to find out how this all 
comes together and work? And are you working with that position when it comes to indigenous people? I just, maybe that's a question after, but I just wanted to at least keep that out there in mind to see how does all this gel within that position and, um, and also how, how our, our kids are treated, I guess. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the question, Chief. I actually don't have the answer to that, Erica. I don't know if you have one. This is a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. Do you have an answer? Um, you know, we have not had it come up at this point. I think that the way I could imagine it coming up, Chief, is that there were, we were staffing a child and there were particular uh, cultural needs that we needed to address. And I think we would then reach out uh, to that coordinator, coordinator to make sure that we were getting that youth everything that they needed. Um, but I can't say that this is something that we've had come up through the chain where we've had an issue with it um, or actually, or any of the other, um, uh, in any of the staffings that I'm thinking of. But what I can do is I'll reach out to Lindsay Barron who works uh, a great deal with our coordinator just to make sure if I've missed something and then I can loop back to you. Um, yeah, I also you. wanted to point out too, uh, Tyler talked a lot about, uh, you know, the staffing and how it's it's a real stressor on, um, you know, FSD workers and how there's not an educational component. But another issue that is really of concern to us is just that when we're staffing uh, kiddos at these alternative sites, we have a lot of people coming in and out that are, you know, FSD workers or contracted workers that we have. So there's a lot of instability for the kids as well, because you may have one person doing a shift and then a different person coming in another day. And this, it just really causes, it's not the stability that we really want for our youth, which is why we've been working so hard to get additional capacity at these various levels within the system of care to build that capacity back up so that we can have the space, appropriate spaces for each of our kids, given whatever situation they may be in at a given time. Um, I'll just respond quickly. I know, uh, thank you for uh, children to Marshall uh, periodically. And also you have to understand the situation. There's still a lot of fear uh, that's going on within our um, population and a lot of times they don't always um, self-declare or even identify. So you're there could be children that are being missed or fell through the crack. I just we can have a conversation later, but I really think Marshall should be involved with a lot of different policy or discussions around um, how to identify. I mean, uh, so anyway, we can we can take it offline. I just want to at least keep that in the forefront of your mind because often we're off we're always forgotten or left behind, or it's always a tough situation. So I just wanted to at least bring that to your attention. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'd welcome that conversation because you're right. It's important that uh, we're not simply waiting for somebody to self-identify that we're looking to make sure we're addressing needs and, and looking for those needs. Right. Elizabeth. Yeah, it's okay. I just wanted to pop in um, and give a little bit of an answer as well. Um, I had spoken with Lindsay about um, her and Marshall's work pretty recently. So I just pulled up the update that she had given me that I was um, thinking I could share with you all. Um, so she had said that currently um, the work is uh, regarding impaneling a new child protection team for statewide Abenaki partners to enable us to share information and partner during an open child safety intervention. Um, and that group is working on uh, gathering some information so they can create a practice guidance, a checklist, or even an add-on to our cultural context guidance specific to engaging and working with Abenaki tribes and people. Obviously, this is all work that is still ongoing, um, but I just wanted to, to jump in there, and I'm sure Lindsay could give lots more um, additional information on that, too. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I think lastly, I just want to say, even though it's important for us, but I imagine there's a lot of cultural differences with new Americans as well, um, because there's a lot of similar tribal um, things that they're coming from that may have some impact that extends past Abenaki people. I just want to at least uh, not forget to mention them as well, 
um, because I know sometimes they have a different culture and a different way of looking at things than the U.S. does, and um, <clears throat> they 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 need representation as well. So I'll I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hey Don, <clears throat> I appreciate that. <clears throat> and that you know I'm I'm just going to fill in the I'm gonna just uh, replace every place you said Abenaki with uh, black folks folks and um you know and then there could be another group that could come in and say the same thing which goes to the another another point is is i'm looking at the report right now and i don't see any racially disaggregated data <clears throat> on that on that report uh in the act 23 report and i'm wondering as we're making all of these policy based decisions to what extent that they're data driven in that respect uh for all of the reasons erica that you just mentioned and more. Um, and this is not, <clears throat> I don't imagine we would get to the bottom of this tonight, but that's just an observation. I don't, I mean, mm -hmm. if, if you want to respond, great, but I, I just, I get it. We, we're not going to, we're, we're not going to solve the world's problems tonight. Um, but I also just wanted to point out that this obviously also bumps right up against the juvenile justice system. First of all, you know, I just want to be really clear. This whole picture is incredibly bleak. All of it is bleak. It just in looking at um, the services that are provide, provided, the impact that they're having, the lack of visibility that we have uh, on these uh, demographics, uh, the fact that um, you know we've just gone through a severe round of regressive policy that uh, puts more in doubt in, in uh, the hope of the um, the whole idea of uh, the uh, raise the age uh, as well. Uh, so um, it, I, I'm, just, I'm just also thinking that it seems like what we've just done legislatively makes this situation worse. I'll leave it there for now. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, certainly of what I'm going through, this is the bleak part of it for, for me as well. And um, But also I think there is plans and hopes and designs to stabilize many elements of that. So I think I'm getting, I'm building to that. I'm building to what I feel is uh, potentially hopeful. And yes, I'm, I think I'm going to get into the juvenile justice side of this in a moment. But uh, I just know that this is an area of concern uh, for a lot of folks, what we're doing with alternative setting staffings. Um, and I just want to say that I think everybody feels that. I don't. I don't think there's anybody that's wanting this as a practice that we stand behind. Um, it's a necessary reality that is coming up for us in this kind of immediate environment, um, and we're looking for solutions out. And so we're going into all these settings, including this group here now, uh, always with open ears about potential options forward. So we have a couple other stakeholder work groups that are trying to figure out ways that that as a practice isn't a practice that we continue. Um, can folks still see my screen? I think it says I'm still sharing. So great, I can see you both now. So I figured it out. Um, any rate, I just wanted to have this up for a moment so you could see we're having to organize our work around this practice that we want to end. Um, and I think the next, if I can get back, there it is. So the broad approach, we, we, you know, this speaks a little bit to our values. Um, we're, we're recognizing that all the individuals we work with, whether they're justice involved, whether they're only involved through the context of um, uh, uh, the child welfare side of DCF family services um, and more, uh, almost universally trauma is a factor in those lives. If nothing else, the trauma of involvement with our systems is present. And so we're aware of that, and we're all we're very interested in mitigating the effects of that. So having a trauma uh, responsive system is uh, is is kind of the priority for how we're looking to build everything we're looking to build. We want to make sure it's consistent with therapeutic approach. Um, we want to be respectful of the brain science. I appreciate. Uh, uh, Mark, you're bringing up um, uh, the Raise the Age initiative, which is also very much aligned with the science behind a developing brain and what that means. I'm always excited to talk about that if folks want to talk about it. 
um, and that these are Vermont kids. They're all Vermont kids, and this is not about places. I think often when we're having these conversations, there are folks that talk about, oh, this is a Burlington kid or a kind of a more metro kid or an out-of-state kid or uh, this kid, and there's sometimes we fall into these patterns of this isn't a kid who's my community or from my community, and DCF, our perspective on that is if you're a young person who runs into a point of crisis within the state of Vermont, you're part of Vermont's children. We have a responsibility to serve you and care for you um, because you're in here at a point of crisis in your life. Um, and this might be for a kid who's in, you know, uh, a, a very rural small town in Vermont, or this might be a kid who's in a more urban location, but they are all of our kids and we have a responsible this responsibility to care for them and their families. And so we have um, a statement of principles that are really about guiding the development of programs and settings for the HESOC, because what we don't want to do is recreate mistakes of the past and design programs that are designed or, you know, design programs that are intended to be, um, I'll just say carceral in their approach um, that has its place. Um, Derek, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm speaking no ill of the Department of Corrections, but for a developing juvenile brain, what we do understand is that the worst thing you can do is over respond. If you over respond to them, you are likely to entrench them in behavioral patterns, which become recurrent throughout their adult lives. And so for us, we wanna make sure our approach is grounded in the reality that these are young people who are doing normal development that might be on a tough part of their normal developmental arc. And our responsibility is to support them towards um, developing as, as, as we all have a right to do. And Kaya, I do see your hand up. I should pause so you can share. Not a big deal. Um, I just had a question because I honestly don't know the answer. So of your for DCF, I know the answer up in other places. Of the 100 kids who end up in the higher end system of care, roughly what percentage end up out of state? Because I know you're talking about keeping kids in the community. Yeah, um, roughly half and half. Um, so in-state programs, I think... Uh, it, there's different ways DCF tracks them, but at one point we we're saying our residential in-states, we have like 48 residential in-state and I think 44 out-of-state in residential program. Now those residential programs were not including crisis stabilization, so mm -hmm. these numbers don't match up with the slide that I right. just showed y'all. Um, but generally speaking, half and half. Uh, I don't think any of the development, I'm, any of what I'm proposing that we're building or any of what I'm about to show you we're proposing to build or are building um, is going to eliminate our out-of-state placement. And the reality behind that is there are people who need specialized treatment settings mm -hmm. and Vermont simply cannot host every type of specialized treatment setting. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is to dramatically reduce um, how many are out-of-state. And the reason being is because if we're just looking at a young person with a series of, let's just call the mental health challenges that they're set to overcome through a treatment, that's not incorporating all of the important, meaningful contextual elements of their life that DCF has the opportunity to look at. That might include juvenile justice, it includes family systems, it includes um, issues relating to economic security. It goes much, much broader than just what is the acute mental health condition that they're getting treatment for out of state. And to solve most of those problems, we need to keep them engaged with their family. So all of what we're doing is trying to make a ro more robust system closer to home so that we can bring kids closer to their families more quickly. That's our guiding principle, if I could just say it. Yeah, thank you. I was, you're doing better than some other systems <laughs> when I have had a state placement. Good, good. Um, so, uh, and then most of the rest of the slides, I'll give them all to you so you can see the walk down of how we go into these. But generally, this is how we broke, broke down um, what we're looking to expand in our high-end system of care. And so this is, the first one is secure stabilization programming. The second one is secure treatment programming. Uh, and then we're talking about 
Um, it says staff secure crisis stabilization, but this is actually, we already have this level of care. We're looking to diversify it so we have more programs that we have access to. Um, and this would be non-secure. And what secure means is there is a locked door. A young person cannot open the door and leave of their own volition. Now, sometimes those programs have a delayed locked door where you have to lean on the lock for a certain amount of time to get out. And that just gives staff some time to respond. Usually that's in the instant that there is a immediate risk. There's concern that a young person is at a state of duress that they might run out into a road, for example. So, um, but those are not locked settings and people do have the ability to abscond from those programs. Um, and then the last one would be psychiatric residential treatment programming. That is um, a level of care that exists somewhere between what we talk about when folks talk about the adolescent programs at the Brattleboro Retreat. That's a hospital setting, a hospital level of care. Um, this is a notch below that. It's still operating under a clinical, uh, a clinician, uh, specifically a psychiatrist. Um, and but it's a it's it's um, a program type that is Medicaid reimbursable as a placement option, and it is above anything that we have in our residential system of care now. So it's kind of somewhere between that hospital level of care of like there's an acute crisis where there is concern that somebody might kill themselves or someone else. And as soon as they don't meet that level of care, this is a level of care where we can do sustained treatment. And a lot of the young people we have out of state um, are in those PRTF level programs, psychiatric residential treatment programs that can be specialized. All of those kids, would not be able to come back, but we're hoping a large amount would be able to. So we have programs in design behind all three of these. Um, and maybe I'll flip through the slides so that folks can see them. I will share them to the group. Um, Tyler, this, oh, yes. Uh, Sorry, before Eric. you um, move off, I just wanted to add a little bit of detail for the psychiatric residential treatment and call it PRTF. We do have, um, we did put out an RFP and we had an apparent successful bidder um, with the Brattleboro Retreat to put up a PRTF uh, for us. And the neat thing about this um, initiative is that it's going to be DCF, uh, Dale, and the Department of Mental Health working together to have this PRTF so that we each of these programs will have beds so that we can really uh, work together to try to help this particular need of youth. So I'm I'm really excited about it. And that PRTF, what Eric was just describing, is the last slide I have in there. So again, I can stop sharing this if folks are okay with that, so we can all see each other comfortably. Um, and I would just love to open it up for discussion of what's bubbling up for people and what they want to talk about. Okay. Kaya, do you have your hand up again? That you No, okay. Oh, I should add also, um, uh, Mark, the next time we come back, uh, we very much like to get into the data. Uh, so even though that wasn't included in the Act 23 report, I think that is something we're, we're, we'll be prepared to bring next time. And we have done some asks. We're trying to find out how much we can um, break that apart, all, all these data or many of these data apart by, by race. A lot of this has to be done manually because our systems are very antiquated and clunky. Thank you. Chief Stevens. Yeah, I just want to, one of the reasons I've been appointed to this um, panel is to keep reminding people that everything has to be looked at through a lens of culturally appropriate whatever, a policy, um, treatment, training. Um, I, I just don't want to keep losing sight because what your treatment is may be different than what our treatment is. Look at the boarding schools. Look at look at all kinds of other things uh, that happened in the in uh, Brandon School for Boys. Look what happened at the uh, Waterbury State Hospital when it comes to our people uh, and others. I'm just saying is uh, we weren't worthy to breed, right? So uh, our the treatment was to sterilize us. So I, I'm just want to make sure. I'm not saying. I'm not trying to go off the, the the deep end, but I keep I want you guys, everybody, to keep being reminded that anything in policy that deals with our kids, especially, 
Uh, and we've learned from the past that everything needs to be looked at through a culturally appropriate uh, lens, um, first and foremost. So I, I just want to keep emphasizing that. So, so thank you. That's a worthwhile reminder, and I, I appreciate that. And I, I'm glad you're here to continue to remind all of us. And I think for talking about our treatment programs, it, it's important for us because we know of the disparate impact of child welfare on people of color, which is why the programming that we will be doing will have our, um, of course, the SHRU look at it, our statewide racial equity work group, as well as DCF's um, director of, can't remember her title, uh, race, uh, inclusion, and belonging. It's important that we continue to have that lens on the work internally us as uh, workers looking at it as well as those people that have that policy lens so it, it's critical yeah thank you because i've done a lot of that with also the department of corrections because they're also on that end after people are incarcerated there's also that piece that i've worked on heavily with uh lisa menard and a lot of the other people and and some of the stuff happening in springfield which is uh, more of an adult situation but still there's still a lot of cultural stuff that's being neglected. So I just want to thank you all for uh, listening because it does affect many things here. Mark? I think Kaya was up there first. Kaya, oh, is your hand? I'm not sure what you're doing with your hand. It doesn't yes, I know. My, my computer's been a little possessed. I apologize. That's fine. I just want to build on what the chief had to say. Um, when you're thinking about new American communities, a really good and not long read to really sort of get a picture of this, especially when you're dealing with the intersection of mental health, culture, and even some physical health issues, which we have, is spirit catches um us and we all fall down. If you have not read it, I really, really recommend you do. And Erica, there may be a couple of extra copies floating around at DMH because we bought a whole bunch. Um, but it's just, it really makes you start understanding how if we don't take culture seriously for new American communities, how we are actually just like with indigenous communities, we're working against that culture and you're not going to get cooperation or understanding. But this is really clearly illustrated. Mark? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> before any of that, um, I, you know, we we got to trace the legacy of slavery to the treatment of black folks and, and black bodies and black minds uh, in our current mental health care system in the United States. Uh, we've got to take a close look at um, the fact that that was the predecessor to the prison system. Uh, uh, they So there's culture, yeah, um, that it, I think it all kind of goes together. Um, but. To me, you know, it's kind of it kind of leapfrogs the discussion to get out ahead of ourselves uh, in talking about um, culture before we talk about race, uh, because uh, we, we're the original culture. Um, and I'm not trying to um, say that in any way except for a factual way as far as how we built this nation. Uh, so listen, I know it ain't I know there's not that many black folks in Vermont. Um, but there's there's nothing uh, you know about the um, the criminal justice system or the the uh, mental health system uh, that's nice to black people, nor has it ever been. Uh, and I and the the uh, rising tides lifting all ships, Tyler, it doesn't work, uh, especially in this. So I so I so definitely I want to um, just flag that uh, it's not it's not. It's not even like revolutionary or anything what I'm saying. It's not um, like a big um, revelation rather. Um, it's just, to me, it's, it's more mind boggling that we're sitting here in 2024 having this, con this conversation. Um, because 
if we look around is you don't have to look far. You look around what some of the other states are doing uh, and some of the progress we made. I mean, I'm the Health Equity Advisory Commission co-chair, okay? Wouldn't the heck would you have a Health Equity Commission for in the first place? Um, so I, there's a lot of work uh, to do across the entire AHS, um, you know, in, in this respect, um, you should, you should get, uh, um, Antonia Hilton, H Y L T O N, um, that book called madness. Mm -hmm. Um, you should just Google that right now, the book called madness, Antonia Hilton and read that. It's a quick read. It's about 300 pages. And so it can level set in, in the conversation. And, and I'll just say, you know, just conclude just say, and just say that we're having this conversation is the reason why is because we don't have a governor who's made this a executive mandate to address these matters with a, with a priority of racial equity across all um, systems of state government with a whole of government approach. So there's a lot of discretion in almost pretty much almost every initiative that you see in play right now, are, they are legislatively born, um, but they're but they're executive executed, and you, so you get what you get. So I I just I really believe strongly that. We should also have a serious conversation about what's going on out in Virgins, and I'd love to hear the answer to that question, how that how that decision was made on on the week's grounds out there where we got a job core. That's also out there, which brings black and brown youth from all over um, the nation. Uh, so that's going to conflate an already existing issue out there, um, not to. You know, I know there's probably nobody on the call that can answer it. Eric, I'm not going to put you on the on the spot because I know you didn't you didn't make that decision. But um, I I would love to understand how and why that decision was made out and to put that um, that facility out in Virginia's as well. Uh, if it, maybe maybe we can talk about that in June as well. Thanks, Chief. I'd be happy to come oh. back. I I actually was deeply involved in that decision and happy to discuss it. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to quickly. I'm not going to take too much time. Like I, like I said, this isn't really a competition between race or any of that stuff. It's more or less. It's it's different. Everybody gets div divided and division. I just the reason I mentioned culture. It's not just indigenous, but some of the new immigrants are coming from refugee camps. They come from countries where if you get in, if you get arrested, they take you out and shoot you in the back of the head. There's no there's no democracy. That, you know, I'm saying is you have to understand that some people who are coming to this country, especially new Americans, they have they have a different culture and a different way of being and a different way of interacting with not only police, but but refugee camps and other things. Some some people are there a long time. So uh, we have our set of issues. <laughs> new Americans have their set of issues and black and brown folk have their set of issues. They're all different but equally important so that's why i just want to clarify that you can't use one treatment plan for everybody that each one has to be kind of tailored to to the needs of the individual or the uh or the whether it be culturally or racial that it, it just has to be considered that's all i wanted to make a quick statement and then uh that's all i'll say further on this subject thank you I really appreciate the point you just made, Chief. Um, and I think that's one of the things that when we're talking about treatment uh, programs and all of these programs, that's something we build in at a contracting level at the beginning now, that every individual going through these programs has an individualized treatment plan that considers their culture, that considers their race, that considers factors rele relevant to their life. To some degree, these programs have some structure that is universal to and and then that we also have um uh um case review committee uh a, um kind of a multidisciplinary process of understanding what appropriate levels of care are there's a number of different ways we consider each individual and their individualized needs 
And if we just have a categorical, here's the solution for all folks that go into this level of care or this program or whatever, we're, we're going to miss the mark with, uh, you know, ninety nine percent of them to hit to hit to hit it right with one of them. Um, so all of these programs should have indiv individualized and specialty treatment plans. Um, this is just how the state is organizing our resources to be able to make sure we have the most robust continuum of care possible. Because the starting point I made is if there is not a full continuum of care, then everybody in that continuum of care will be in an inappropriate placement, either too high for them or too low for them, but they will not have their individualized needs addressed within an incomplete continuum of care. So all of this is geared towards that. And all of these things we're flexible and looking to develop and we're engaging stakeholder feedback in these processes of what we're building. So, so it is the idea to get the experience of individuals. I think one of the conversations we haven't had in this room uh, yet is the importance of a youthful voice. I know Sheila, we've had that conversation because I went down there and heard some youth voice around some of this practice. So making sure that young people are also represented um, in terms of what they identify as their needs and what the effective pathways to for them are gonna be, because it is a changing world. The world that I grew up in does not look the same as the world today. Um, and also my lived experience is not gonna be the same as others. So I think there's a broad group of folks that we need to really be gathering feedback from. Anyone else? Okay, I have a question. What kind of education do you need these various levels of staff to have? Like, do, I mean, you know, are they LICSW? Are they, you know, do you have, who's running the facilities? Yep. Generally speaking, all of these programs operate under the uh, a clinical director. So somebody who's a licensed okay. clinical director, um, all of the staff in there wouldn't be licensed social workers, um, but they would be under uh, acting under the supervision and direction of somebody who who, who is. Uh, okay. And we have a regulatory. Uh, I'm not a regulator, so I don't know all of the specifics, and they probably vary from program to program. But a lot of the staff who work in the program, it's 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 not an uncommon um, job for somebody newly coming out of their, you know, getting a bachelor's degree, coming out of college, looking for a job in the field of mental health or, um, uh, or human services to, I, I cut my teeth as a youth counselor in, in a residential treatment milieu. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Please remember this conversation will go into June. Um, that, Marshall Paul will be here as well. He will be coming and um, also presenting. Um, but just keep that in mind. Uh, Mark. Yeah, um, I'm, I was going to ask this at the beginning. I'm sorry for being so like uh, late with, with the question, but I just want to understand wh what the outcome, what, what are we seeking to accomplish here? What are we trying to do? The moment we're gathering information, are you talking about the RDAP? I should have asked that first. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, y'all yeah, appreciate that. No, I'm, I'm, what I'm getting at is, is love information, love it. Um, the um, here, you know, just I'm thinking about the charge of this panel and, and what it is that, uh, you know, y'all are here to do and what the uh, intent was uh, when we set you up to do it. I'm just trying to put this into context, this conversation, and just better understand critically, you know, what, you know, what outcome we're seeking to, to gain from, from this uh, discussion and for, or these series of discussions. I just want to know, what are we seeking to accomplish? That's all. The RDAP is seeking to gather information at this moment. It's not made a decision on that it will do anything necessarily, but it has been the point has been brought up by several panel members that mm -hmm. there's something to look at, and that's what we're doing right now. Okay, and and, and where I'm contextualizing it 
and and you know I'm going to kick up a little dust every now and then. It's, you know, I still love you. Every um, now and then. Yeah, you know, but what I where I'm at is is you know because this you know just for just as just to remind myself is the racial disparities mm -hmm. in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel. Just so I can make sure I'm in the right place here. So I'm just trying to figure out at the end of the day with what it is we're figuring out. Now, this can be rhetorical for now. We can just leave it alone. But what I'd like to what I'd like to understand is how is how we progress that as an objective, how we address how we address systemic racism, uh, how we address that within this particular system. And okay. I just haven't seen anything that indicates that we're on that path right Mark, now. Mark, it's slow. Oh, trust we me, nobody knows that better than me. Good. That you right. will remember that we have two hours a month, and right now we're gathering information. We will be doing the same thing next month. So in terms of the kind of movement that you're suggesting, it will probably be at least after June, more likely in July. Um, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting, I'm not trying to get any movement at all. I'm, all I'm doing is just really one simple question. What are we doing? And if we don't have that answer right now, I can accept that. But it's, it's not, I don't, want, I don't want you to read into any, anything else because it's really just, it's just that surface. That's all okay. I want to know. Then I answered you. Anyone else? I, I would I would just also float out there. What, what I'm trying to do here is kind of articulate the position of my department and why it is we're taking the action we're doing for everybody's understanding and to open a doorway for 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 reciprocal feedback on right. that conversation. Well, and we're certainly aware because we've had other studies. Kay, has your hand back up? Okay. Yes, sir. Well, I also okay. okay. Go ahead. I also think, and correct me if I'm wrong, this feeds into the justice piece because of juvenile justice, which does come under the purview of DCF. Yes, it does. So it's going to weave back in eventually. It most likely will. Thank you. Tyler, I think you're muted. I was going to say very, very much so. It's very related. And I think one of the, what I've always celebrated is the strength of Vermont system of the many weaknesses we have. There are also strengths um, is that our, our child welfare system also houses juvenile justice as a practice. And there are challenges, logistical challenges that come out of that. But the benefit of it is, is we, we look at every youth who comes into our care, um, whether it is through a juvenile justice lens or through a, uh, a family needs lens, um, or sometimes that family needs lens comes our way by way of uh, mental health concern or um, developmental or intellectual disability, because other, other avenues come to us, but we can look at family systems holistically. And I think a limitation to some systems in the country are that the context of doing youth justice work are limited to the conversation around their delinquent act, so to speak. It is we're talking about that within that context. And for us, we enjoy the flexibility of saying this is part of a whole system. There's many pieces here. And a, and a, a kid who comes into our care from a justice perspective can enjoy any of the benefits of approach to, 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 to broader assessment and, and broader treatment. Um, and, I, and I think that can be a real strength and, and, it, and it can come with some, some challenges too. So uh, that, that's one of the things I like. It, it makes this a little bit sticky, but I think there's opportunity in there. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, let me ask. Um, curious, what have your numbers said at all about racial disparities in terms of treatment, in terms of... Um, while being picked for certain programs, I would imagine as well. I mean, all those high impact, high discretion moments. I'm sh you've done work on this. I know that, and so I'm curious to know 
sort of leading us along here where you have seen perhaps problem areas that just need to be, you know, addressed at some point soon? That's a great question. I hope we get into it more in the June meeting when we're actually bringing numbers to this equation. I would say one problem area that's coming up that we, you know, we're talking about this use of alternative settings as um, as a problematic Treatment set or a problem, not treatment setting. It's not a treatment setting. A, approach to to, to placement, um, and I can say anecdotally, we're trying to get the numbers of do can we get a race breakdown because all this stuff is just tracked in various spreadsheets that we have to put together. Um, but I think um, that uh, that there have not been any youth of color that have been through that setting. If there are, they're 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 extremely underrepresented in that. Um, but I, but I, but I'm not sure. I, I I'm going to wait till I see what it is. Okay. Um, uh, sometimes this is again, it gets hard because the numbers can be small. Sure. Um, and so sure. we're going to face that reality. But I think we need to. We still need to. They're the numbers we have, so we need to be able to be transparent about them. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. You look troubled. <laughs> no, I was just thinking. I, I'm glad Tyler ended with. Um, you know, let, let's wait for the numbers because sure. I'm not sure either with the alternative settings, but I would, I think there likely have been some youth of color that have gone through the settings, but I can't say for my, a fact either. Um, it's just, uh, and to me, the longer we do this, it's important that we have these, the things that you all are talking about in terms of being culturally responsive and making sure that we have an eye toward race, because even if we don't have youth of color that have gone through it now, right. we might tomorrow. So I just think that it's important for us to, to keep a focus on. Oh, and um, I do want to add to, um, because I know there's a, a lot of interest in our high-end system of care. Yeah. I am facilitating a um, high-end system of care task force that's looking for um, really creative ways to help build out the system that Tyler was talking about that's been so diminished. And uh, we have people from DCF, we have uh, community providers, uh, folks from the hospital setting. We have many people that are involved in the group. And I'm just going to put out a blanket invitation if any of you would be interested in um, attending uh, the task force. I'd love to have more people join. It's an hour a month and uh, Tyler's there, of course helping me as well. So um, if any of you are interested, please reach out. Great. Thank you kindly. Um, we, okay, no, scratch that. Mark. Yeah, there, there is, um, there's, I mean, there's quite a bit of data that's out there, you know, um, and, and it's in, in different places and it, and it, but it all tells the same story with it, the stories that it tells is is, is that um, you know because of the legacy uh, of slavery, that what we have is is we have racially disparate and adverse outcomes across all social determinants of health. Period. Hard stop. And so it's so it shouldn't be um, a big surprise to us uh, to find it in the in this system either. And and if you don't see it, if you don't see the representation in the system, then the disparity is. This is that they're not in the system, and that's a problem. <clears throat> so, so I think that um, you know, gone should be the days that we're trying to figure out uh, where the data is, or if the data says something. And now should be the days where we're finding out where the data is, getting it, and creating institutionalizing processes where in which we don't have this conversation in a few a few years from now because. Unlike most people on these calls, I've been around uh, this for about the last 10 years here in the sit in the state of Vermont. Uh, and I, and this is the conversation we were having then. So it's unacceptable, not that it's anybody's fault who's on the call, but it's unacceptable that we would have to have this conversation now that, oh, we don't know where the data is. And, um, and I think it's and unless we start having different conversations, we will be having this conversation 10 years from now. I have no doubt that we will. I mean, we tried putting that report together that just got submitted. 
That require. Oh, I'm sorry, not that one. The report that, was, uh, that led to the DJ DRJS. Yeah, that was the around. search for the data for that was akin to finding the Holy Grail. It was all over the place. It was tucked into very strange places. And we were making jokes about, now that we have it, let's make a time capsule up on Camel's Hump That's and bury exactly it because we'll do. never be able to get it back together again. Yeah. Um, that here's, here's what I think, though, at a time, though, is, is, you know, and this is, the question, the question is, is, you know, Whose responsibility is that? And I don't think we we want to get into that uh, right now. But it's certainly not that RDAP's responsibility to go and chase down all of this data from all of these uh, departments in in various agencies. But um, again, it just goes back to the, the lack of the mandate, um, the whole of government approach that that's placing a requirement on various agencies and departments to do just that, <clears throat> with the specific intention of doing it for the purpose of racially disaggregating it and disaggregating it with other um, uh, groups that are represented by systems of oppression and so forth. Um, I think that, <clears throat> again, this is a good exercise for that reason because, Tyler, <clears throat> you see where the data is not. And, and I think this is, a, you know, this is a good exercise for folks back in DCF uh, Erica, at least within this particular area, where it'd be a great drill to go back and say, okay, well, you know, what data points do we think are really, really important enough to begin to collect data? Um, what's the manual process to, to collect it? How do we automate that process? And, and when we run into issues like privacy, representation, all of the other re reasons why people always tell us that data are unavailable or, or inaccessible, um, how do we create uh, escalation protocols and how do we create methodologies whereby uh, we can uh, es you know, escalate and, and acquire the data and then institutionalize its acquisition and moving forward. Right. And those are the conversations that I'd love to be having. And I, I think we're, we're starting to build the data apparatus that we need uh, Absolutely. In, the, in the ORE and in other places across the state. Um, but but now I think it's time, and it's not even to prove what we're talking about here. It's it's so we can it's so we can baseline, measure, and then in, inform our mitigation strategies in a way so we can prioritize our resources to ensure that we're not driving through the neighborhood where one house is on fire and we're spraying water over the entire neighborhood. Okay, that's all. Kaya, and that every if anybody else has anything, put your hand up now because after Kaya, I'd like to move on to the next agenda item, which is going to take some time. Okay, so the one thing I will say in defense of DCF is I think they've been asking for new computer systems year after year <laughs> after year so that they can easily report out on this type of data. And they're forced at this point to collect data on spreadsheets and corners. And if you try to dig through the database, trying to find the answers half the time will probably crash in the database. Right. Um, so I will say that I'm not saying that it's right, but I'm also saying as a state, there comes a time we need to make the investment. We have the oldest existing system in the country. Yep. So, so that's all. Okay, thank you. Tyler, you're it and then we're moving on. Okay. I just want to appreciate it. Thank you, Kaya. Uh, appreciate you for saying that. We've been begging for a long time. Um, we've been, we, we plug the data system into every request, every report, every time it comes around, we've been asking for it. So that is there. And I also just wanted to be clear, data is one of those things that's a little tricky. Um, because like I said, we are committed to coming back here with specific data um, that does disaggregate race to the extent we're able to. We're going to bring what we can, what we have access to, and share that with this group. We want to be transparent around that. Um, and also, um, when you ask for, I want this piece of data, sometimes that requ we don't have systems that 
pull data out in nuanced ways. You get this kind of generalized data. So I certainly wasn't trying to undermine um, all the points, Reverend Hughes, you made about um, what we know about social determinants, health and disparity nationally. I believe what we will see in our trends are not that far different than we see in other places, perhaps better than some places, I'm sure worse than other places. So I'm not trying to paint the picture that we don't have a problem and that this isn't real. Um, it's just for us at this point, we need to be knowing clearly what the data point is that we need to gather because how we get at it or find it, if it's even possible, changes with each one. And hopefully a more responsive system will be able to do some of that behind the scenes for us. But right now it's gonna be some, uh, some pulling up spreadsheets and literally counting and making assumptions. Thank you, both you commissioner, deputy commissioner and Tyler, thank you very much for this. Um, it is a good start for us to get to know what the lay of the land looks like. Um, some of us have known, others of us not, but now we're all on the same page. And I thank you very much for getting us all to that point. Um, we can't start having these discussions if we're not. So thank you. Um, Please come back, Deputy Commissioner, if you would like. Um, open invitation. Um, and that will be that for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I appreciate everyone's uh, comments. And I would love to come back another time if you all would like to have me. We, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. And you. Okay, um, what we have next is the proposed letter to the legislature that I mailed out to everyone, oh, a week ago, a little more. Um, I had, as I had told you last time, I had lunch, not lunch, no, I didn't. I had a half hour meeting with um, the attorney general and the important point regarding this letter, and this is very simple, and it's also not going to make anyone on this call happy. Um, there are no mechanisms that exist within state government to do what we asked in the letter, namely to declare a moratorium until an equity eye can be carefully, systematically, and intensely focused upon the simply, I don't know, the tsunami of legislation that has come through the legislature this session and has been um, really bypassing all social justice um, organizations during that time. Um, I know that um, very few people have been called we have been asked once, and you will recall that we were asked to look at an 80-page bill in about 36 hours. That went over like a lead balloon. Nobody did it. I re reported that to, at that point, House Judiciary. Um, so one of the it would be great to send this, absolutely, or some version of it, or if one of you've totally rewritten it, great, um, whatever, something. But it will not do anything at this point. Um, the recommendation that the Attorney General gave is that we wait and use this as the core of a letter that would go out closer to the beginning of the next session but not too close <laughs> so that people actually read it, absorb it, and understand that they have some responsibilities that they need to fulfill. Um, she was very clear about reiterating the importance of this body. Um, but as regards what happened this session, it has been, and we all know it, it's been kind of a nightmare. Um, we to some degree have been insulated from it because we had a really huge report that was on our, in, in front of us and we had time to finish it. 
Um, unfortunately, well, we had been given to understand, and you all will remember this, back in uh, last year, um, around this time, actually a bit earlier, that our participation in the legislative process was seen as one of growing importance. Um, to that end, they repealed the sunset. Um, to that end, Susanna was made, uh, or forgive me, the director of racial equity was made a member of this panel. That person was given two appointments to make on their own. Um, all that has happened. Um, but the sad fact seems to be that we got outsmarted. Um, I don't know what happened with the legislature this year. I do know that um, Martin Lalonde is going to start discussions with us probably as soon as he can find his brain again after this session. <laughs> uh, poor man. Um, and we will talk about improving that pipeline that we have discussed, it feels like forever, regarding um, getting things from the legislature to us in a timely fashion. Now, one of the issues that I did not discuss yesterday with the Attorney General, given that we only had a half an hour, was the idea that we really do need staff, that we needed staff for ever. Um, because when, and I'm not saying this is a complaint, but yes, I am. Um, when it comes down to it, if there's something that needs to get done, it falls on my lap pretty squarely. Um, and sometimes that's fine and I don't mind. And other times it's crazy. This session was crazy. There was no way that I could have done that and helped shepherd that report into the legislature's hands. It simply was not possible. Um, I'm not willing to have a stroke for this. Um, so we did talk about that. Uh, the other issue that will come up, this is not connected to the letter and it's nothing to worry about right now. We all have to be reappointed, everybody who's a community member. Um, we kind of missed that um, partly and actually pretty squarely because of the pandemic. Everything was such at sixes and sevens. Nobody could handle anything else. So I certainly understand that. But I did bring that up because it is legally required. Um, but that's where that conversation went, was that this is not the time for this letter. People appreciated the letter. They appreciated the tone of the letter but did not feel that this was the moment for it. That's really all I think that I have to say on that right now. My recommendation would be that we wait. And I don't say that with joy, quite the opposite. I'm annoyed. Anyone else, comments, co I mean, Chief Stevens. Yeah, thanks, Ant Anton, for all your, your work. Um, Thank you. And we do understand that they, for some reason, the legislators and others feel that these are full-time positions that, that they want all kinds of decisions made on it. And it's, and there are no full-time staff. It's all volunteer. Um, and, I think that we looked at not the right time because they're always trying to turn down, you know, the budgets are tight. They never have enough money. Right. I, I think even though if we don't want to be overseen by the, if you want to be separate than the attorney general's office, because I mean, that's, even though it's the attorney general board of racial disparities, it's supposed to be separate. I'm not sure why um, the attorney general and maybe maybe Julio uh, uh, Julio or uh, um, could could mention that you know they they do contribute a lot of money to the general fund with their lawsuits and other things. Why why couldn't there be some way of supporting this this um, 
this Attorney General Board of Racial Disparities that fall squarely in their lap, even though you're separate, but there's also, just like other commissions that have administrative support and other types of uh, things maybe that maybe they could help fund or find other ways to get those funding. I don't know, it's just a thought. I know probably he's gonna say, well, that just goes to the general fund and that's that's the law. But uh, I'm just wondering if there's a there's an argument to be made uh, to the legislators that this needs to have more funding or uh, like they did with the, uh, you know, all the other boards and commissions that they've created funding for. I'm happy to address that. Go ahead. Um, so, I think you answered your question in part, Chief. I mean, uh, most of our money goes to legis the general fund, like our civil rights unit. We recover a lot of money, and none of it goes to our unit um, or to our work. It goes straight to the general fund. Uh, generally speaking, and this is not just true with Vermont, but for most states and a lot of major cities, enforcement agencies don't get to direct the funds that they collect through fines and settlements because it can create it can create an institutional bias towards having more punitive funding and there's a way of funding government operations that more recently has been known as the Ferguson model. Um, but I do think that more broadly, there's a space to be advocating for um, committee and I think legislative support for the RDAP. And I think, Eitan, you, you mentioned, I think at last month's meeting, the AG, I think it is fully supportive of that. And I think willing to lend their voice to it. Um, there, there are a couple of things that I think for, for RDAP folks, and, and I'm the newest maybe member uh, of, of RDAP and an interim Perennial. member for that. Um, uh, one is that is, you know, I think there are a couple things we can do between now and, you know, really it's after Labor Day that the bill requests start coming in. And I think that's the time where you make the push to have bills or build ideas going th through the RDAP process, because usually by January, it's far too late. Right. Uh, I think that's one. I think another, I don't know that it's been emphasized to the newer med members of the legislature that uh, rep members of the RDAP that are government agency representatives, uh, when they are called to testify on bills, and that includes our office, uh, um, but also includes DCF and DOC and, and the Defender General's office, they are typically not speaking on behalf of the RDAP. And I think there is a misimpression in some committee members, the newer committee members, or maybe they're, mis they're mistaken or misled, I'm not sure which, into thinking, because uh, I've heard people say, well, on this bill, we had three members of the RDAP speak. We had the Department of State's attorneys, DOC, and public safety. Uh, all of them speaking as from their own institutional rather than a collective um, interest, um, and so um, and so that's um, you know that that I think uh, needs to bear in mind. The other thing in terms of like what can be done to ensure kind of impact assessments occur, uh, and I think maybe I missed some of the RDAP discussions on this before, but you know. Iowa was the first state in 2008. I think there were nine other states. Maine, I think two years ago, enacted legislation that creates mechanisms for either electives so or committee can elect to have an impact statement or it's there's some sort of mandatory statement. I've been reading recently a lot of literature about uh, Iowa's system that I think they have 200 public equity, you know, impact statements that have been developed. Uh, I think maybe one or two meetings ago, I sent links to what DC, Washington DC does. And so I think that's a question to have with legislators about having some mechanism. Because otherwise it's just going to be up to the, the discretion of the legislators who might find it expedient or constructive to have RDAP here and, and not there. Um, and I don't, you know, I think I, I that's just not, that's just not predictable for going forward and so i think that's part of the discussion to have um so i'm i'm happy perhaps after the meeting if people want to if people haven't looked at what other states are doing i, I have a few links i can i can send perhaps okay. as a follow -up to, to the meeting maybe when the minutes circulate or something um Great. 
because I think there are there are some examples out there, and it's and and those states and uh, and some of the major cities have concluded that the only way to have some consistency is to make that to have some sort of uh you know to some sort of requirement that's on the books um so that it's just not kind of ad hoc um and um, you know and so I'm, I'm not saying that is the solution for Vermont but that's something I think we have time to consider over the summer yeah and as I said at you it will probably remember as well I had mentioned that representative Lalonde is interested in having those conversations with us when the summer comes um uh, Representative Arsenault, who's usually here, um, you'll recall at our last meeting, um, offered to write some legislation regarding the use of the equity impact assessment tools, since there is none, <laughs> which I never mind. In any event, there is none. She offered to do the, um, the lift on that. And so, um, I would recommend taking her up on that myself. Um, she's not here tonight, so it's not really a good time to go into this deeply. But I do think that that's something we may want to consider. Personally, I think it's a great idea. Um, they're not going to use it if we don't make them. They've shown that already. They're not using them. There are two equity impact assessment tools in the state. They're really easily found. I can find them. If I can find them, an unripened tomato can find them. So um, they're not hard. This is this is just willful, and we need to get beyond that. Don, you had a you had a point. Yeah, just a just a quick point. One of the things I was thinking it was also thinking outside of the box. I know when it came to the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs that we changed the legislation to allow. Uh, uh, the the commission to hold grants and funding, um, and if that would be changed to allow um, maybe maybe the attorney general's office or some other place could have a grant writer that could concentrate on pulling down federal dollars sure. into this, and then it would be self funded through uh, uh, through a position that is writing grants to help offset you know asking the legislators for money. But you know if you could change the law like they did with the commission. Um, to allow to to accept grants or to hold uh, or hold the funds for those that particular reason, then that might be another compromise that would open a door. Because there's got to be a lot of federal funding out there when the juvenile justice system and that okay. for for people to be able to pull down. But we would need someone to do that grant writing to pull that right. down. Right. Um, and that's maybe where the professional support or administrative support, right. maybe the AG uh, G's office could help with that, if they have that ability. I don't know if they do, but anyway. I, I am not certain 100% either, but I do know that the Attorney General is 100% behind the idea and will do everything that she can, I feel. That was made very clear yesterday. Um, she has no interest in like stepping in and running the panel or anything like that, but she is absolutely committed to making it function as best it can. Um, we'll be meeting again. Um, I didn't ask this, but I don't think there'll be any problem with her coming and speaking to all of us um, at some point, whenever that's seen as appropriate, we can do that. Tyler, go ahead. Thank you, Eitan. I just, um, I wanted to, uh, I guess, share that I did have some opportunity with speaking with my own leadership and kind of up our agency leadership uh, about your letter, um, talking it through. I wanted to appreciate the fact that as a sitting RDAP member and being in those meetings, you very eloquently capture um, some of the complicated nuance of conversation that we have in this room. And you really do reflect the RDAP really well in your writing. And um, so I was, I felt good that I was able to articulate that to my own leadership. Like this is a, this is an articulation of the conversation that the RDAP's having. Um, and so I, 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 and, and they were appreciative of that. And I think there was a lot of, there was a lot of like, uh, I'm, I'm supportive of this. I'm supportive of this con content and concept. Um, my own leadership had some suggestions that are probably more aligned, aligned, aligned with, 
the conversation you had with the AG um, that uh, there might be some strategic benefit to deciding when we release such a letter, how we organize the letter, and but most probably significantly conversation around how do we organize a concrete asks associated with the letter. So it's not so much a reflection just of, of, of where we're at and what's happened and what are you, you know, but saying this is what the RDAP would like to recommend that the legislature does in the coming session. And so I just floated out there for something for us all to consider if we are in favor of delaying for a little while. And I think that's a very prudent and wise plan. Um, maybe we can dedicate some time, energy, maybe a couple of us can form a subcommittee to conversations yeah. around what we would ask the legislature to do. And I think um, specifically working with uh, Representative Arsenault about um, about the, the, the mandated inclusion of a racial equity uh, report, at least where it's involved with criminal or juvenile justice right. application, right? It's not every law that goes through the legislature has racial equity impact, yes. but our group is really looking at juvenile and criminal justice kind of more specifically. So I think we can make some concrete recommendations. And I think as we start to unpeel that onion, we will find that, ooh, this gets more and more complex. Like, who is Recording responsible stopped. to fill this out? Who is going to, um, you know, and, and, and at what time is it uh, uh, read? Or how do we make sure it's integrated in the process and not just done on the side? But we right. can actually come up with some recommendations. So I think that's exciting. I would love to lean into that work, too. Um, Great. And so I just wanted to offer that up. Great. I I think the idea of a subcommittee makes a lot of sense. Um, I kind of like more of us here before we put that together, if you don't mind. I would love to do it tonight, but there are some of us who just aren't here. <laughs> um, does that make sense to you, Tyler? Yeah, I'm just floating as an idea. No, 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 I know. I'm just asking. I mean, you know, and I'm Tom, you did. Anton, you did hear that the recording stopped, right? Somebody, I mean, it came across, I don't know if that's important or not, but it did stop. I assumed that had to do with the, um, I don't know what you call them. I'm not wise about those things. The, you know, people have those AI systems that take notes for them. I think that's what it was referring to. But thank you. Um... That's where we're at, I think. Um, the I, I it I found myself after meeting with the attorney general, I I, just, I had a bit of despair. I was a little frustrated. Um, I'm not happy with how this session went. I I have gone back and forth between saying, well. They're new. They don't know about the RDAP. They don't know how the RDAP works. We should have done a presentation early on. We were busy doing all sorts of other stuff. It gets difficult when you meet two hours a month. Um, one of the things, and I'll just put this out there, that I did say is that I think we may need to look at some readjustment of how this panel functions um and how it provides what it provides to the legislature one of the things that i said and this is very concrete two hours a month is not enough i mean it's just not enough it's i mean if we're going to do these reports and we're going to be reading this legislation and such now i realize the reports are biennial nevertheless if we're going to be you know given the report and then they read, you know, you read the report and then you get into the hearing and, oh, my God, look, it's totally different. It's still 80 pages long. And, um, you know, this happens all the time. It's really difficult to do this, not only and have another job, but also to have simply two hours a month in which to do everything. And I think what we're finding now, at least in my opinion, is that this is really, we're really right up against it. In a certain sense, we've been very successful. I think Rebecca's quite right about that when she says that. 
that part of the reason we're getting these requests or have been this year, I don't know, but that we have been getting these requests is because we've been, as she puts it, a victim of our own success. Um, that's fine. I don't think that means the panel's falling apart. I just think it's a moment of transition. Um, the other issue is, you know, is the balance right between community members and governmental actors? Do we want to look at that? I mean, all that needs to be talked about. I had a very brief discussion at the beginning of the session with um, Senator Sears about some of this, and he was intrigued. We didn't go any further than that. I mean, I haven't seen him again. <laughs> that was back whenever the hell it was, January. I don't know. In any event, um, there's... There are a lot of big discussions, I think, that need to happen here, and not because, I don't know, we're bored, but because there are some really fundamental things that are becoming difficult, or if not difficult, actually impossible. Early on, um, Mark raised this whole thing about the Cannabis Control Board. He had asked me last session, is that something that, you know, the, the equity issues that come up there, is that something the RDAP would look at? I said, sure. The reality is, theoretically, that's absolutely true. In terms of practicality, it's quite something else, and it may become impossible. We are blessed beyond belief by Tiffany and Laura, and I mean... Oh, my God, the Division of Racial Justice Statistics. Thank you. They have got a bunch of the data. We now need to be able to write something. But we need to be able to have the time, literally the time, to write something. Um, and so a lot of this has to come up. Um, this is nothing new, right? I mean, organizations go through these kinds of reworkings all the time. And I think that's just what's going on here right now. And I think I can shut up now. Tyler. I'm chatty tonight. Y'all started me up at the beginning of this meeting. I keep wanting to talk. <laughs> um, I just, as you were talking, Eitan, I had this thought uh, to tie into what I was last talking about. If we were able to furnish some recommendations around the structuralization of the use of a racial equity impact assessment for legislative processes, if we made that recommendation, is it possible, and I'm just asking and exploring with this portion of the group we have here, that that tool be a really nice interface with this group? Right. Rather than the legislature saying, I want you to read an 80 page bill of like red line legislative text. Here is the third party racial equity impact assessment around the conversation of this bill. I would like the RDAP to consider that. Right. And that might give us some something to that that's digestible. Um, in a timely way for our group to be able to process. And then, of course, that doesn't stop us from going into the bill language as it right. manifests itself. But maybe there is some solution in there towards yeah. like actually building process that we become a valued component of the legislative bill processing practice. It's an excellent thought. It's an excellent. I wish, well, when Representative Arsene recovers. <laughs> Um, and we see her again, <laughs> um, that would certainly be something to ask um, because we're starting to get, I mean, you're starting to give shape to what this bill might in fact look like. And I think that's good. Actually, I think it's excellent. Anything else? Yeah. I, um, yeah, I just wanted to align with the strategic decision to harness the instinct and energy that that letter was like manifested in in, in a beautiful way and and put it to i think what has the promise of a more planful Sure. strategically impactful um, approach 
And I just want to honor the the instinct and the need to put voice to it too, though. Um, you know, I think it, it, in a world that um, is, you know, more binary than um, ever necessary, if, if binaries are necessary, um, I don't just want to, I just want to not lose sight of the emotional truth that gave birth to the, to, to that letter. And then the opportunity to hold it out and collectively say, okay, is this the optimal vehicle through which RDAP at this moment can advocate for its systemic inclusion in the legislative process in the criminal legal system? That's a conversation. Um, it, the determination does not diminish the emotional truth and the need for that voice that uh is in response to that tsunami that that uh that you characterized it a, a time of the legislation the inability to meaningfully digest and consider the impact along racial uh and marginalized community groups so i just i just want to hold it back up um, cause there's a both and for, from my perspective, I, I, at Julio, I pre you framed that in, a, in, in an important way and spoke to the, I think, ongoing need to consider how the executive or, or government actors who work within these structures can wear our RDAP representative hats and whatever institutional positions we may take specific to the pieces. Um, and, um, and at the same time though, that the history of these bodies in legislatively, I, you know, is the history of the systemic racism and colonization that keeps getting perpetuated. So I just want to give voice to not okay. losing sight of that personally for me and that that letter, it doesn't go away for me, right? Mm -hmm. and, and its truth is there. So I just felt compelled to appreciate that. Okay, thank you. It's not going anywhere. I think, I, I mean, I formally, I would say, I don't want to bring this to a vote because there's no support on some level right now from the commissioners. They're not against it, but they don't feel this is the right time. I can't argue that. So my instinct is to simply table it. And we'll. Get, I'm not going to say when we'll start back on it, but I'd rather await events and see what Representative Arsenault is going to do, what Representative Lalonde is going to do, what approach wants to do. I mean, all those people I would like to hear from um, that I think will um, impact that letter and only make it richer. So that when we do submit it, as Julio says, what, September-ish? Something like that. A little bit before September, I think. A little before that would be fine. You know, so that when we get that, when we get to that point, that it's really the letter it needs to be. So that would be my recommendation. Any discussion on that? I just had a follow-up question in terms of procedure and next steps too. Thinking about the conversation at last month's meeting and having recently reread those minutes, um, it just brings to mind the opportunity to advance the strategy that it seems like you're uh, proposing and, and at least we've heard some support for um in communication with the equity caucus as 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 well insofar as that is a sub body within the legislative body that um that i think is simpatico with the you know the goal and intent of what 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 the letter was trying to give voice to so 
We can do that. Ah, thank you, Mark. I didn't know that, uh, Mark. Well, may, maybe that's the the SEC, the the, the um, oh God, SEC, Social Equity Caucus. Yeah, they're dormant. Okay. So, um, if there are any objections, please voice them now. Okay. Having heard none, then I'm just going to leave the letter. I'm tabling it. And this will come back. Thank you all. Um, the last issue are the exit interviews for Ching and Witchy. Um, we talked last month about these and a sort of nebulous subcommittee formed. And that was Dan and Tyler and myself. Sheila raised a very important point that that needs to be a racial, a di racially diverse body. I want to make sure, Sheila, if you're able to, or just send me an email at some point when you feel like you can, um, does that seem like enough that if there are three of us on the SCUB committee and one of them's me, um, does that work? Or do you see problems there? As I say, don't feel like you need to answer right now, but it would be really great if you could um, weigh in on that for us because you brought that up and that was a really important um, point. So we are, Dan are and Tyler, are you still willing to be on this? Okay, good, good. Um, we will, let me get through next weekend and then we'll talk about when we'll meet. I'll like set up a doodle poll or something like that. All right. Then, oh boy, I better hurry. Net relevant known policy updates, legislative moves. There's nothing to say there right now. <laughs> They're done. Um, or so they think. Um, they'll be back on June 17th to deal with expected. Um, okay, thank you, Sheila. Um, they will be back to deal with expected vetoes. Um, new business. Anyone have new business? Okay. Our next meeting is the 11th of June. It'll be hot and disgusting, um, but everything will be lovely. Um, we will move ahead with this, with all of these initiatives. Again, I hope no one's feeling, I was really despairing yesterday, and then I just went, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's just change. Eitan, you know you hate change. So, you know, it's just change. We're going to end up with probably the same looking panel, but it's going to be changed in some important ways that will allow us to get more of the work that the mandate asks us to do done. So that's all I have to say. Mark, great news, equal protection constitutional amendment survived, PR4, congratulations. Your your body deserves a lot of the credit on that one. Um, I think you're the only body that got anything done this session. Um, oh, nah, he says. Um, nevertheless, that's good, a great achievement. Um, so I won't go through the usual rigmarole because it annoys people of getting people to make a motion to adjourn and so on. Is everyone cool with adjourning? That's the new Robert's rules. Is everyone cool with the journey? Ooh, yeah, bye. we are. Lovely. I will be in touch. Thank you all. And um, have a good evening.